and welcome to Bad Ideas, the show where we look at misfires, mistakes, and miscalculations from all throughout history. I'm Tony Southcott. And I'm Albert Berg. And the bad idea that I'm going to be talking about today, Tony, is putting out forest fires. I mean, that's that's generally a good idea, right? I mean, look at what happened near San Francisco and everything this year. You would think... That it's always a good idea, Tony, based on what a lot of people uh, know and have been told. And I have to say this bad idea started its journey with me investigating a Reddit post about eucalyptus trees and their connection to the wildfires in California. And there was this very fun looking idea that someone had posted on Reddit about how some people had brought some eucalyptus trees over from Australia and how they underestimated how long they would take to grow and then they finally did grow and the oil ended up making them highly flammable in the fire that decimated california last year and i believe some this year as well is it just a particular type of resin that's more flammable than most it's so almost all of that post if you happen to see it was untrue they actually grow (laughs) super fast uh they they did get brought over from australia but not in the 1920s it was earlier than that there's a lot of stuff that's not, that's wrong about that. They do have a flammable oil in their wood. However, all the research I was able to find from like actual professionals involved in the forestry firefighting type industries indicated that that was not a significant factor in the spread of these wildfires. Hmm. So I was adrift and I had heard some stuff about these fires that I have to mention, by the way, we have almost a personal connection to we know some people uh on the internet uh, good friends of ours on twitter uh who have been personally and deeply affected by these fires uh our friend john his parents lost their home and their whole neighborhood burned and we're talking about these incidents that a affected people's lives okay in some cases took people's lives and also cause billions of dollars in economic damage And so anything we can do to prevent these would seem like a good idea. And while I was listening to coverage of these fires, someone who was being interviewed mentioned that they thought that California should start doing more control burns or prescribed burns, as they are sometimes called, in their forests. Oh, I've heard about the idea before, especially because you get rid of a lot of that thickening underbrush that's going to make it just go crazy when there is a fire. And if you can kind of set the lines properly, you can get rid of that, and it's ugly for a little while, but you're going to have a lot less dangerous fires later. That is exactly correct, Tony. I have a whole paragraph that you've just described about why controlled burns work. The idea behind a controlled burn is similar to how you would start a real fire, right? You can't go up to a log and stick a match against it and start the log on fire. You got to have kindling. And the undergrowth in the forest is very much like that kindling. The more you have, the higher the, the fire will go. And a lot of times you can have a forest fire that will burn along the ground if there's a small amount of undergrowth. And it won't hop up to the tops of the trees and become what's called a crown fire. But if you don't have that undergrowth thinned out somehow, then it will burn very, very high and catch the leaves of the trees higher up on fire. And then it is much harder to fight and it spreads much more easily. And one way you can do it, as you as we've alluded to already, is these controlled burns. And the reason that it was surprising to me that they were not doing this already, Tony, is because I live in Florida. And in Florida, we do this all the time. Like, I know people whose job for the government is to set the forest on fire in very specific places at specific times. And it sounds scary, but if you pick your battles, right, you, you can pick where you're going to set it on fire. You can preset your fire breaks. You can choose a time of year that's not super dry. You can have environmental factors like creeks and bodies of water around you that will also help limit where the fire goes. You can pick a time of day to start the fire when the wind is blowing in a favorable direction. There are many, many things under your control if you are starting these fires with a plan in mind. A lot of time it's also making sure that it like backburns up to a road or things like that so it just can't hop. Like, That's there's correct. There's a lot of different ways of doing this. And I, I've known a few firefighters that were 
they weren't quite as into it as like the guys you're talking about where it's their entire job for the state, but they'd walk around with these fire sticks and kind of backburn towards fires and things to put them out that way. I, I, these guys might do other things, but I happen to know for a fact that the, some of the time they get to ride around on a four-wheeler with a flamethrower to set the underbrush on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Take a pretty significant pay cut to be able to do that, I think. <laughs> so, I, got, I started wondering, why is this good idea not implemented everywhere? This is a little bit of a backdoor bad idea, Tony. I want to talk about a good idea that not everybody's doing. And I started digging into the history of controlled burns and found some really interesting stuff, I think, anyway. So, we're going to talk about that a little bit. The earliest recorded controlled burns happened way back in colonial times and even before colonial times. We suspect that Native Americans were setting the forests on fire on purpose way before us white guys got here. And when us white guys got here, those of us who were from England and the British Isles in general were already used to this idea. Now, this was not at the time a conservation thing. It was not a fire prevention thing like we're talking about now. The original controlled quote-unquote burns, the setting of fire on purpose to forests, was to clear out the undergrowth so people who had cattle could more easily drive them through these areas and ride their horses so they wouldn't get tangled up in tiny bushes and vines and little branches and stuff like that. It made cattle grazing much, much easier. Although there was a balance there because eventually some people who wanted to graze their cattle in the forest got mad because they were burning up all the grass. <laughs> Gotta find that balance, apparently. <laughs> it was very much about a balance. And it's also about a culture difference. The, it was very common in the South to do these controlled burns for whatever reason. Again, possibly because of the Native Americans, possibly because of people from various areas that settled here that were used to controlled burns back in their home countries, but it became a Southern common thing. Whereas people in the North didn't do any of this. It just wasn't part of their culture. And on top of that, you had a clash between the people who were doing these burns for the sake of having room for their cattle to graze and to get through these forests and the people who wanted to cut down the forests and sell the wood. Loggers didn't like controlled burns, and not to say that anybody was necessarily 100% right in this argument, because apparently these intentionally set fires in the South happened so frequently that they were stunting the growth of the forests. And so, to push back against this, the logging considerations in the 1930s and earlier even started trying to campaign for zero burn forests. Uh, they sent a whole group of guys, like, I, I mean, th the paper that I read about this made it sound like this huge campaign. They were called the Dixie Campaigners. Uh, and these guys got in these big box trucks and they went to the South with educational films that they would show. They had literature. They would lecture. And their whole deal was to change the public opinion about this intentionally set fire thing that was happening a lot culturally at the time. Uh, it was seen as very destructive, but there were still a lot of people in the South that would do it uh, because it was tradition or because they thought it would help out with, again, with cattle grazing and things. And there was this concerted effort to stop these intentional fire settings. And into this public opinion campaign came one of the most successful public opinion campaigners of all time, Tony. Is this Smokey? It's Smokey. In the 1940s, <laughs> the tiny, cute bear that survived the wildfire became the poster child for this anti-fire setting campaign. And this, to me, was news, okay? Because we, Smokey's still around today. He's still campaigning hard for, you know, not setting fires. But I'd never realized that setting fires was a thing at the time. Smokey wasn't just, hey, be careful to put your campfires out. He was saying to people, stop setting the forest on fire on purpose, guys. It hurt me. <laughs> Look, I'm a tiny bear and I got burned up. That is bizarre. I would have thought that he was just straight up a campaign from like a, 
from one of the wildlife services just to make sure that people like were more responsible with cigarettes and all that other stuff whenever they're in the woods. Well, he was from the wildlife service, to be fair. I don't know. This is very foreign, I'm sure, to people today. But back then, if you were a big company and you had a heavy economic stake in a particular thing, sometimes the you would give money to the government and they would help you out with your cause. Uh, yeah, and like that all stopped with Citizens United, and like it just like it's such a relic of the past. How could we ever think that that was ever a good idea? Fortunately, we've moved on from that. <laughs> era <laughs> yeah, we need to do an episode about citizens united that's a very bad idea but anyway continue so the forestry service and and again to be fair the forestry service it, it has reason to not want everything to get burned up they if if there's gonna be fires they shouldn't just be randomly set by you know joe bob bill from down down the road because his pappy did it once a year and so he gonna do it too and he doesn't ask anybody or look at how dry the forest is or anything so so they had good reason to be wary of these fires and especially because you're building up in the area as well and a lot of northerners at the time also had started coming down this happened a lot after the civil war especially the southern economy was in tatters and so people from the north saw an opportunity to come down here and buy up a lot of land and they culturally weren't into the purposeful burning of their land. And so they started exerting pressure to put a stop to it as well. However, interestingly enough, as they started exerting this pressure, they noticed something that was changing. They noticed that these bobwhite birds who are a type of quail, Tony, I don't know if everybody has bobwhites around them, but it's I don't sort think of I've ever seen one indigenous to the South. They make a, a call like Bob White, Bob, Bob White. That's why they're called Bob Whites. Um, they whistle it, but you know, I, I, I'll have to get a, no, they totally just know Bob White. They've been <laughs> looking for him for a while. <laughs> it's been a while since I've heard them because they're still on the decline. Honestly, I remember hearing one as a child, but these birds were becoming less and less common. And these guys like to hunt these birds. And so what they did was they went out and they hired this man, Herbert L. Stoddard to figure out why the bobwhite population was declining. And Stoddard studies the forest and he studies the bobwhites and he eventually comes to the conclusion that letting the undergrowth of the forest go wild and never burning it away was negatively affecting the bobwhite population. The bobwhites nest on the ground and they need a certain amount of ground cover to be able to nest. But Stoddard's estimation of the situation was that when you had too much overgrowth the bobwhites weren't able to move around and hunt for their prey and things and he further developed a theory of the forests in the south that said these forests have developed alongside relatively frequent fires whether they were set by man with the native americans or possibly set by lightning strikes beforehand the pines in the south, these longleaf pines, actually do better with an occasional fire coming through. And the wildlife that's indigenous to this area occasionally needs a fire to sort of clear out this undergrowth and make things better. There's even a, a specific kind of pine cone that only releases its seed when it's burned. Yeah, I've heard about that and how, like, uh, with Yellowstone and with a lot of different places, whenever they've had fires, it's always tragic whenever it's happening, but a lot of times it kind of rejuvenates the soil and lets a force kind of reseed itself in a better way. Yes, and I do also want to mention that even though we do have occasional prescribed burns in the South, and that is a very common thing, the Bob White population has not resurged itself there are other factors in their dying off including fire ants uh coincidentally named not for the actual fire although they do feel like fire when they bite you but uh bob white's still in trouble even though we've started doing prescribed burns mr stoddard might not have been a hundred percent correct on that specific linkage but he does start pushing for this occasional burning prescribed burning kind of thing and the Forestry Service pushes back initially. They they understand where he's coming from. I think they're not like crazy, like anti-fire people, but they're just now having the success 
in the anti-fire propaganda world. They've got Smokey. People care about Smokey. He's a cute bear. And they're like, we're just now getting people to stop this, Mr. Stoddard. And you're coming to us and you're telling us, as we've been telling people to stop setting fires, that we should also start setting fires in front of them on purpose and say that it's a good thing. <laughs> Are you insane? And, and you can see kind of where they're coming from there because, again, they were fighting against this cultural uh, thing that had they had just started to be able to uproot. And if it came back, if they looked like two-faced kind of people who didn't know what they were talking about or who were saying one thing and doing another thing, they might have lost a lot of ground. However, they kind of opened the door a little bit. They said, up until this point, they were called controlled burns. The Forestry Service allowed for the possibility of something they called prescribed burns, which were controlled burns, but called something else. And they started testing them in the late 40s, early 50s, in some of their government-controlled forest areas, and eventually the practice caught on, and they understood the positive impact that it could have. Uh, in 1958, the National Park Service, which had a super strict anti-fire period, no fires anywhere policy, uh, recognized that the controlled burning was necessary for the survival of the Everglades National Park. And by 1971, the Forest Service sponsored a symposium about controlled burning, uh, where they essentially decided that, yeah, there's consensus. This is good stuff for the South. And specifically those kinds of trees, they, they're designed to be able to withstand occasional burning. Maybe not as often as they were doing it back in the day. Maybe not every year, but every three or four years. And... To this day, Tony, I have gone camping and driven through forests where the bottoms of the trees were burned as a result of these controlled burns that they do frequently here in our state forests. And as far as I know, for the most part, nobody's been injured. They're not perfect. I don't want to over overstate the helpfulness of the controlled burn. Sometimes they get out of control. Sometimes wind does things that you're not expecting. Sometimes the fires jump things that you had planned for them not to jump. It is not a 100% perfect system, but it has allowed us to be more in control of our fire situation here in the South. Yeah, it's something that Colorado's been talking about adopting for a while as well, in that uh, we have a lot of pine beetle kill off. And during the summer, that's made entire swaths of forest, like thousands on thousands of acres of just standing dead trees waiting to catch on fire. It's like eventually it's going to happen. It's going to cause huge problems and it already has in some areas, but they're probably going to have to burn these forests down before it ends up becoming a giant sprawling thing that they can't control. And it's interesting for a long time. The consensus was that this was something that was peculiar to my region, the South, which is why it hasn't caught on in other places, but there's an evolving understanding of this process. And in 2015, an ecologist working for the Forest Service in California named Malcolm North published research in the journal Science in opposition of total fire suppression in California's forest. His point was essentially, we can't put out every single tiny fire ever that burns. We need to let some of these things go. And in response to that, the Forest Service in California first tried to have the paper suppressed. They called science and tried to talk them out of publishing this guy's paper. It's not just his. There was a, it was a group paper, but they did. He was on the byline. And when that failed, they forbid him from speaking to any journalist for a year after the publication of the article. They have the power to do that. If he works for them, I guess they have the power to say you're fired if you do. And he still does work for them, by the way. Interesting. It's an understatement to say this issue is complicated because especially if you're in California and you've seen the horrific damage that these fires can do, someone coming to you and saying, hey, y'all should set some fires on purpose is probably going to be a tough sell. Yeah. <laughs> There's also the problem that public lands and government lands are often interleaved really complicated. Somebody might own a house right in the middle of some government managed land. And if the government sets a fire in that forest, 
what is that going to do to that person's house? Even if it saves a bunch of other houses, how do you reconcile the fact that you've on purpose set a fire in a forest that's maybe next to somebody's house or business or private property of some kind? So it's not a simple issue, but I think it's one that we need to at least be more honest about considering the possibilities of. California is making steps forward. They have tested control burns in several of their government managed forests. They have test forests where they do various things to see what works and what doesn't. They've also uh, tried thinning. So not, not cutting down all the forest, but cutting down some of the trees in the forest uh, to create more open space. So the fire doesn't have an as easy of a place to jump from tree to tree to tree. Both of those things show a lot of promise. I was going to ask if you saw if uh, thinning the forest out through logging and replanting and kind of cleaning it up whenever everything's done, if that was as effective as a controlled burn. It seems like it could be, or that it might even be easier to do the undergrowth clearing after you've already logged an area so you can at least use those resources. The tricky thing on the logging is that sometimes you're going to leave behind small detritus that will just easily spread the fire anyway. Uh, It's... Again, a very complicated issue and also complicated by the fact that California is home to some people that love nature a lot and saying to them, let's burn down some trees or at least the things under the trees on purpose might not sell so well. You might get images of Bambi running away from the forest fire and animals being caught in their burrows and think all these poor guys. But the important thing to remember is that nature is going to have fires anyway. There, there will naturally be fires, and if we put out the fires that start naturally, we may be doing just as much harm as when we start a fire on, on accident that causes a bunch of houses to burn because we had let that fire get out of control. So what, do you, what would you say the ultimate wrap-up bad idea is here? Ultimately, the bad idea is fear and uh, the inability to accept new ideas which is a really big one. But in this specific instance, uh, it's about this one particular idea of controlled burning. And if, as long as we resist this because we don't understand or because we haven't had it around us, I think we're, we're setting ourselves up for failure. It's similar to how people in Vermont resist the idea to having someone pump their gas because They've never done it before, and that ain't how they do things, so we aren't going mean, to do the it. the videos that came out of Oregon were pretty hilarious of people pumping their gas for the first time. <laughs> but you can understand, if someone hasn't ever done that, if they're not used to a thing, and a new thing comes to them, that thing is scary, because it's a new thing. If the new thing is setting the forest on fire... <laughs> <laughs> it's an extra scary step. I, as someone who's lived in an area that has done this for 50 plus years can say this works guys. It's not as scary as you think, but and as somebody who's accidentally set things on fire, it's a scary thing. Yes. You do want to let the professionals do it. Uh, but you do want to let the professionals do it. <laughs> Call some guys from Florida. They'll come down and help you. We know what we're doing. Yeah. We've got, got the flamethrower four wheelers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That'll do it for this week's folks. Thank you so much for listening. If you like this episode, click the subscribe button wherever you're at listening to this. Don't forget we have a Patreon over at patreon.com slash human echoes. And if you have a bad idea you'd like us to talk about, you can send it in to badideashow at gmail.com or tweet us at human echoes. See you guys next week. Bye.